Okay, let's start with this one. This one is an observation case. It has to do with, and I'll zoom in here, move things around a bit. This round calcification here, which corresponds with this. It has some calcification in the middle maybe, but otherwise, at least on the frontal projection, rim-like calcification. And looking on two projections, it ought to be located in relation to the left heart. So let me bring in next to this one, say, this, and try to get out of that. Sometimes these things link for some reason. It's really annoying, even though I don't link them for that purpose. So here it is, right here, in the apex of left ventricle. Let me bring in another, and tell me if you think there is any reason why we shouldn't straightforwardly call this a left apical thrombus that's got some calcification in it. So a calcified left apical thrombus, just like that. I can't think of what else it should be. Looks like a thrombus. No, it looks, yeah, and it looks like there's an old infarct there. It's thin and aneurysmal. So this wall up here is quite thin, adjacent to it there. So maybe an infarct and a little calcified or calcification in a small apical cavity thrombus, right? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, just kind of a cute, nice case of a chest radiographic finding with correlation. Here is a trauma patient, so I'll show you just what the trauma looks like. Uh, let's see what he has. He's got some pleural fluid, maybe some pleural air. And then this is the CT that follows. So I'll put that alongside. And for this case, keep an eye on the internal mammary artery on the right side. So as I scroll down, internal mammary artery and internal mammary artery, and then right here, where there's clearly some chest wall trauma and some soft tissue air and some bruising, that artery disappears right there. So it's opacified very nicely and right at this point, it isn't. So certainly consistent with a traumatic injury to the internal mammary artery in that location. So they went on to do this procedure. So let me bring this up here. And let me bring in this one, it's got 17 images. So we go internal memory artery, internal memory artery, Oop, stops right there. And it stops in a point corresponding with what we saw there. So there's clearly, I don't know, spasm versus thrombus or some injury right at that location. And I don't see actually extravasation of contrast from that location, but a decision was made anyway to embolize it as you can see there. So that's what followed. So just a nice example of an injury to internal mammary artery. And I don't know whether, and I couldn't tell for sure whether there was a history of a penetrating injury. In other words, was there a knife or a piece of glass or something that actually went in there and then came out and injured the the artery, but it's a nice example of it, of an artery right there. Howard, it looks like the, you guys the, the that, that I haven't mentioned right there. <clears throat> uh, it looks like the cartilage fractured right there. Oh, yep. let's have a look. So let's see if you can see a cartilage fracture. Yeah, it looks like it's dissociated from the sternum. Oh, you're looking right. I didn't notice that, right? 
Yeah, right in there. That should be the cartilage that should be attached to the sternum. I wonder if it's so, just that it was transected. So this is cartilage on the left, and then the one on the right you're seeing is is off. I think it's displaced laterally because you see that rib fragment was overlapping considerably there, right there. Right here. Oh, that's a thought. And it's the cartilage and the fracture and the injury that did it. I wonder if I let's have a look and see if because Jeff, that's what you were thinking too, right? Yeah. Sorry, let's take this one, make this one. Um, what do we look at? A coronal? Go away anterior. Oh, there's a fracture. Up. I haven't looked at this in a while. I'll have to look at it more closely to see. I think you might be onto something. Oh, there's an injury to the sternum there. And you can, Howard, right there, you can see the cartilage doesn't line up right with the sternum. Do, do a little MIP, Howard. Okay. Fractured sternum. Yeah, and right in there, you see, there it is. On the right, that cartilage separation, like Jeff was saying, is fractured. Keep coming up. Right there, that one. Right in here. Oh, there. Mm -hmm. Fracture right through there, right? And this displaced, maybe? Yeah, and that's right where the artery cuts yeah, off too, isn't it? Right there, isn't it? Yeah, I didn't notice that before. That's a good observation. So right in here. Oh, good eye, yeah. I wasn't paying attention to that. Right in here. Okay, good eye, good observation. Oh, okay. I haven't looked at that in a while. I forgot I didn't look carefully enough. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, this is a patient with um, a history of AML and treatment of it involving also, I think, stem cell transplantation. We'll look at that in a moment. So that goes back in time. And then at uh, November 1, or just before that, he had presumed fungal pneumonia diagnosed. And I think it was that, and he was treated for it. So that's November 1. And let me bring in 21 alongside. So take a look and see that progressive opacity develops in the right upper lobe right up here. So there is this, and now in that apical lung, this progressive process develops. Parenchymal, there are a few septal lines, and otherwise a progressive pulmonary parenchymal process, and maybe some bronchial wall abnormality or mild interstitial edema. So this was a process there, and that kind of looks like that. So that's not progressing, perhaps that's actually a little bit better but on treatment, this develops. So let me bring in this now. And well, actually, I'll show you this. So here is the CT guided biopsy. Let me just get this right order. Done of this right up below process, as you see there. And that yielded nocardia. So nocardia. I don't even know how to pronounce that, as you can see there. But I think this particular nocardia is – I guess they're saying that this nocardia Sirius Georgica is asteroides 6. So it's one of the asteroides 6 is this particular organism. 
So that probably explains why this thing was growing, even though he was on these other antifungal agents at the same time. So I'm not sure, I've never heard that term before, but now I noticed for the first time, I didn't read this carefully enough, that it seems like this one is just one of the Nocardia asteroides, but number six. So I guess there's a whole bunch of asteroides. Yeah, Howard, they refer to it now as Nocardia asteroides complex. And so okay. sometimes they don't speciate the specific one out, but okay. they're all pathogens, okay. they're all opportunistic, and they all look the same. Yep. Okay. Soil bacterium, immunosuppressed individuals. So that fits pretty nicely. Interesting thing about it, it isn't just a nice discrete round thing. It seems to have a lot of inflammation around it. And I can only assume that to some extent, maybe the pulmonary lymphatics are obstructed by the process and there's a little interstitial edema in the lung adjacent to it. But otherwise, hmm, no cardiac infection. As you see there, interesting. All right. Let me show you this one and then I'll let you guys take over. So this is a case in which I think we have a really nice example of a interrupted bolus phenomenon. So if we look at the contrast medium on this CT and compare the degree of opacification of blood in the right heart versus the left heart, we can see there is gray going through the right heart and then the pulmonary arteries are relatively gray. And then right down here, at least in relation to these pulmonary veins, in the lower lung zones in particular, we can see black smoke. So in many of these veins, they are very gray. And then in some locations like here, there's an admixture of relatively unopacified and some relatively opacified blood making their way up into the pulmonary veins and then here you can see into the left inferior pulmonary vein in particular. So I speculate that this is an interrupted bolus phenomenon and we're just seeing a head of a bolus ahead in the pulmonary veins making its way through the pulmonary circulation to the left atrium and it's just a matter of timing that we caught the black snow phenomenon in the in the pulmonary veins. I can't think of a better explanation seems to fit quite nicely with other things we see. Any disagreement or is this just a, an interesting interrupted bolus phenomenon and some interesting findings? What, what does interrupted bolus mean? It doesn't mean that there was a problem with the injection, does it? Does it is it just a question oh, sorry. of timing? Yeah, just a notion that the person presumably took in a breath, sucked in unopacified blood, via the IVC, it went through the right heart and pulmonary arteries in the lungs. Yeah. That phenomenon. Was, is there evidence of, um, of breathing artifact here on a lung window? Can we see that the vessels are... Uh... No, not really. Just a little pulsation related artifact on the left side here, but not particularly. I'll go back to this and show you what the pulmonary veins look like again in the lower lungs. All right, I Jeff. It's an interesting mind? one. Yeah, thanks, Howard. Yeah. Welcome sure. back, David. Would you like to give me cases for today? Yeah, I can, I can show a few here. says show my scream here can <clears throat> nobody can see you scream but you can see your screen so here's a um, here's a person who uh, has Sjogren syndrome and has this radiograph from 2013 showing pretty clear lungs maybe a little object up here a little scar or something like that so this person's radiographs have not been that revealing if we go back to um, a CT scan a year before we do see that there's a um, reticular abnormality here in the apices and there are a few lung cysts 
thin-walled cysts that would go along with uh, LIP consideration in this person with uh, Sjogren's. Um, usually the, the lung disease that I've seen with LIP is basal predominant. This one's definitely apical predominant. And later on, there's another CT scan here in 2016. I want to thank Gautam Reddy for pointing out this case this morning. And now there's a blob here in the left apex. I don't think it was, was visible on any earlier imaging. And there are more lung cysts than before, but the reticular abnormality has cleared, so the cysts have progressed. And that's characteristic of LIP, and the cysts are, I think, worse than the bases here, which goes along nicely with LIP. And there is an interstitial abnormality in the bases that wasn't there before. Okay, and this lesion was um, sampled or removed. I don't, I don't, haven't had a chance to look up the history. And this was an extranodal marginal cell malt lymphoma. And evidently that particular style of lymphoma, according to Sean the resident, is particularly goes with um, Sjogren's syndrome. So one expects to see a variety of lymphocytic abnormalities, including LIP, and in this case, a frank uh, malt lymphoma. So there's a spectrum of lymphocytic abnormalities that go with Sjogren syndrome, and this person has that. And then we have our latest CT scan here just brings us up to date on the extent of the cysts, which may be a little bit worse than in 2016, uh, but you know have definitely progressed from the earlier CT scans to 2016 at least, and maybe to 2017 as well. So Sjogren's syndrome with uh, LIP formation of cysts and malt lymphoma. Hey, David, it kind of looks like she's developing some subacute OP or NSIP in the bases that sort of yes. lobular yeah. stuff is. With a nice subplural sparing. Yeah, which would go along yeah. with Sjogren's as well. Yeah, agreed. Okay. So they, they took out the nodule and the nodule, that nodular opacity was the lymphoma, huh? That's correct. They, so. they did a nodulectomy, basically. Um, let's see, this is 2017. We can see how big their resection was here. I haven't had a chance to actually look it up and review what they did. It looks as if they probably wedged it out. I don't think they took the upper lobe. Wow. Okay. So in this one, I don't, you know, Howard, we talked about these cysts before in the setting of Sjogren's syndrome and how often they might be related to you know, some light chain deposition disease. Um, again, I haven't looked up things and I don't know whether there was anything on in the uh, lung resection at that apex that would have gone along with it. But I think uh, LIP itself, maybe without the um, possibly of an amyloid component could probably explain these cysts. Yeah, it's not the LIP that produces them, it's protein deposition. So she well, still has a disorder and there's continued protein deposition. It doesn't have to be amyloid protein. It could be non-amyloid means. Okay, but so you so you, you think that in, in every all the cysts that we've attributed to LIP should really be attributed to some protein deposition rather than the lymphocytic process itself? Is that is that your uh, yes. current? Yep. I would argue also, though, that the you can the lymphocytic infiltration of the small airway wall could also lead to the cyst formation. Yeah, well. yeah, there is. A, that's sort of the original theory, as it were, when the association of cysts with LIP was described um, a couple of decades ago. But there's no evidence to indicate that that actually um, happens. And you can get cysts in the lungs in the absence of the pathology of LIP. So there is the idea briefly that there is a relationship between the deposition of protein and the accumulation of macrophages in response to that. And the macrophages are associated with matrix metalloproteinases, which are basically proteases that lead to elastolysis. So I like that theory better than the LIP theory. Okay. Um, it, again, it's a hypothesis, but there's a lot of uh, strong evidence that that pathogenesis is a much better explanation 
for the occurrence of cystic disease than LIP is. And just to clarify, is the the LIP theory just that you get the ball valve mechanism from obstruction right. of small airways from the lymphocytes? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. Because with LIP, so, you know, the amount of expansion of the interstitium is quite quite pronounced, more so than like with NSIP, and it often distorts the alveolar walls. Because the way I think about it is a similar mechanism to LAM, where you get smooth muscle infiltration along the lymphatics or smooth the LAM cells around the airways that leads to a similar phenomenon. It may, it may be that there's a little bit of both mixed in there. But if you're right, Howard, yeah. I've seen patients who don't have LIP who have amyloid who have lung cysts that look exactly like this case. Right. That's right. Yep. Yeah. So okay. we're working on a paper in response to uh, Travis's request, Leif and I. And when we're finished with that paper, which will be quite soon, we'll present our whole theory about this and a lot of representative examples. So we'll share that paper at the appropriate time. Okay. Great. So um, here's a fellow with a some shortness of breath and uh, an abnormal chest uh, rentgenogram here. So there's quite a large lesion occupying the apex of the left hemithorax and there's elevation of the left hemidiaphragm. And um, um, I hope I'm gonna be able to show you a, um, let me bring up this and see if I have a CT loaded on this one. I thought I did. Okay, so here's a, CT scan on this person, confirming that there is an abnormality uh, in the left apex. It looks like a very big, smooth-walled tumor here with some degree of inhomogeneity. We noticed that the left hemidiaphragm was elevated before, and uh, focusing on the cruse, you can see there's uh, some thinning of the cruse here, implying some uh, denervation here of the left hemidiaphragm. And um, we never did a sniff test to show the abnormal, presumed abnormal motion of this left hemidiaphragm. So it looks as if this big thing up here, it's hard to tell what's originating from it. It looks as if it's probably originating from the mediastinum. So uh, this lesion was resected. My best guess at this thing with a very large lesion like this, um, nice smooth uh, edges to it was that this would be a fibrous tumor because those are the things that can grow slowly and get to be quite large. The patient accommodates them and doesn't present until the lesions are quite big like this one. You can see that there's some, it's causing some vascular compression here too and there's a lot of collateralization. So that was my best guess here and I thought um, that's what it was going to be. They had biopsied this at, at the outside hospital and found um, a lot of necrosis. They didn't identify any any cells that they could really make a histologic diagnosis on. So an extensively necrotic lesion. And then if you look at the, um, here's one representative image from the PET, the PET scan, you can see that it's just rim enhancement and that the in, inside of this thing is probably necrotic and is not taking up the uh, agent at all. So um, any guesses? It, it turns out not to be a fibrous tumor. Um, Nerve sheath tumor? Yes, this was a huge schwannoma, and it was mostly necrotic. But um, and I asked this, I asked the surgeon where he thought it originated. He thought it came from an upper intercostal nerve. I wondered whether it came from the phrenic nerve. Wouldn't that be cool? A phrenic. That would be. Nerve, yes, and of course that's what I was hoping for. But you don't always get what you want. So I was thinking about just lying about it and presenting it uh, according to what I would like you know, because it's Christmas, but um, I, 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 I didn't do that to you guys. Maybe it's, maybe there's a little enlargement of this intervertebral foramen on this left side way up here, high in the thorax, but not for sure. So the, the surgeons carefully removed this thing and they spared the phrenic nerve, but I think the phrenic nerve was already damaged based on the elevation of the left hemidiaphragm on the preoperative radiograph. And um, I asked the surgeon then, where was the phrenic nerve in relation to this tumor, wondering whether it was on the outside and had been stretched by this thing? He said it was medial. So um, this thing really, I guess, is not a mediastinal mass, but an upper hemithoracic mass, more chest wall mass, that's leaning on the mediastinum. 
and the phrenic nerve was medial to it here. So um, it's not as if this phrenic nerve was pushed out by a mediastinal mass that it expanded outward. So um, bizarre presentation here, a phrenic nerve probably damaged by the growth of the tumor itself um, and was spared surgically and was they were able to protect it surgically, but it was already probably too late. Be interesting to see if there's any, since the thing is intact, it's, it's possible it could regrow and reestablish um, a nerve supply to the left uh, hemidiaphragm. Wow. So this is a large schwannoma. It's one of the big ones. I, I think I might have seen one or two other cases of very large nerve sheath tumors like this. So Travis, what was it that triggered that um, that notion here? This, well, when you said it wasn't a fibrous tumor, the fact that it was looked like it's arising from the apex and essentially descending along the mediastinum. Yeah. Because I know I've been burned by thinking something was a big paratracheal, like a bronchogenic cyst that turned out to just be a big cystic schwannoma. I think it was a case I showed a couple years ago that okay. looked entirely cystic, but it was just it was a cystic schwannoma. So same thing on the other side, not quite that large. Got it. Okay. Is it doing to ribs? Is it uh, narrowing or displacing ribs? I'm trying to look at that radiograph and I can't tell if I'm seeing a, a rib abnormality. That related. left first rib looks abnormal. Left first rib, is it somehow? What is this rib up here? First rib. The first rib, the um, I mean, of course, that looks actually funny. abnormal or is there a pressure phenomenon on it or? Something or to say, whoosh. It's um. Uh, it seems to be um, hypoplastic. Running along the edge here, hypo hypoplastic. But the question is, it is it remodeled or is it congenitally just diminutive? I mean, it looks pretty regular. Yeah. Uh, Maybe so, it's a pressure phenomenon. Could that be a remodeling pressure phenomenon being pushed upon? It looks as if it compared to the other side, it is being pushed out laterally. So I think that's 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 not a bad idea. It doesn't seem to have eroded the cortex, but it's okay. probably again, it's probably slow growth that has allowed this mm -hmm. rib to remodel as it's being displaced. Yeah, maybe decades, huh? Yeah. Good point. Very good. Okay. And then um here's a fellow with some uh, shortness of breath. Um I don't know his age right off um, for you here. So he presented at an outside hospital with this abnormal radiograph. Seems to be a lot of consolidation in this left lung and maybe there's a pleural abnormality as well. So uh, he had a CT scan at the outside hospital and indeed he has this very extensive bubbly um, and liquid pleural abnormality here with these big big locules here. Here's a lung that's attached out to the chest wall, some adhesions, and then these big, this big medial pleural collection here with lots of gas bubbles in it. So this is before there any sort of needle had been placed or anything like that. So we seem to have a loculated extensive uh, pleural process on the left. And um, they drained this and then they were unable to re-expand the lung. So let me show you a CT scan a couple of months later. At this point, let's see, we're still on the same one here. Let me, um, I think I can bring up another one here. Here's one later on, this is a couple months after. And at this point, I think it's pretty clear that there's a bronchial pearl fistula. I think we can actually see a few communications between Small, small peripheral airways and this big space here, which would not close. So a drain, you know, this is after a drain had been there for weeks or months. So we're left with this big cavity up here and some pleural thickening, some visceral pleural thickening, but unable to obliterate the, the cavity at this point. So eventually this person had a muscle flap after things were quiescent. So a pectoral muscle flap was in play, put into the chest there to fill this cavity and bring a blood supply in there for further healing. And so this is the final result that we have you now several months after this is December and the original um, infection occurred back in August. 
So a muscle flap has been placed now to obliterate that space caused by bronchopleural fistula. So the CT scan did show, I think, a couple of different uh, sites of entry of the gas into the pleural space from the adjacent lung. The one I showed you, but there were others as well. Okay, so BPF, and the organism in this case was uh, a uh, organism acquired by aspiration of a Fusobacterium necroforum, probably acquired from the, from the pharynx, the same organism that's involved in, commonly in Lemire syndrome. Okay, so aspiration pneumonia, presumably, and then bronchopleural fistula, and then persistent uh, cavity treated by uh, muscle flap. Okay. So they used the pectoralis versus the serratus. Actually, it's a lot of there's a lot of tissue in there. Yeah, okay. I'll, I will check that. I uh, I need to verify that. I thought I thought I read uh, pectoralis, but I'll go back and check for sure and clarify that when I post the case. Good point. And then uh, this person has a uh, lung nodule here with a kind of funny shape to it. Looks like a curved lung nodule. Those are always the worst. Uh, plus a hiatal hernia, and that combination of a curved lung nodule and a hiatal hernia is completely irrelevant. Okay, and um, had a CT scan. Uh, had had this radiograph, and a, this is uh, several months later. I just want to show you that at this point, this nodule is more ambiguous. It hasn't really grown though. And at this point, there David, was. David, you put a stethoscope on there. I'm sorry. Did you place your stethoscope on the chest wall right there, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, I, uh, Howard, I uh, unpacked my stethoscope. Uh, I found it in, in a drawer at home and I picked it up and it uh, turned to powder. The, all the rubber just uh, disintegrated and, and fell to the floor as a, as a fine mist of stethoscope. And I was left with holding these metal pieces, the rubber parts completely disintegrated. Um, the other thing is I haven't really missed it um, in all these decades. So I don't have a working stethoscope, but if I'd had one, I would have put it on this chest and I would have been entertained by the result too. So um, let me show you uh, what's going on here. So indeed there is a vascular abnormality down there, this nice little tangle of vessels. And that's the big one. Uh, farther down on the left, there's a smaller one down here. And then on the other side over here, we will see a third a little tangle of vessels. And there are probably a, a few other, even smaller ones scattered around. And this person had telangiectasias, I think had a history of nosebleeds and stuff like that. But, and uh, they elected not to treat this um, because I think the, it was not symptomatic. I asked if the person had clubbing and the answer was no, there was not clubbing, which is which is pretty common with this condition. So this is Weber Osloronto or hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasias by a number of uh, clinical criteria. Very nice. Okay. So three three ABMs. Okay, those are my cases. All right, thanks, David. Brett or Travis? I have a few. Uh, I don't know if Brent has some too. Yeah, I have some too. Yeah. All right, well, we got about 23 minutes. Brent, are you in the reading room? Is is anyone else there watching, or are you? Uh, yes, yeah, so we have like you, uh, more people watching. All right. Well, here's one that I've never seen before, and this is a crazy case. It's been reported once in the literature that I can find, and that's it. And um, I'll admit that the, the MR was done before the CT, and I kind of went down in flames on the MR. I didn't have all the history, but also I think it's a, an abnormality that is better seen on the MRI. But I'm going to show you the CT. So this is a patient who has bilateral superior vena cava that you can see here. And this was being done to evaluate this. His story is he's 72 and he had a murmur or something. I think he had a murmur that prompted, or no, they, they saw in an echo that he had a dilated coronary sinus. And so they did a bubble study and he had a TIA, a pretty significant TIA immediately after they injected the bubbles, which is a story I didn't know at the time um, until digging around afterwards. So they did an MR and then we did a CT to further evaluate what the issue was because they wanted to see if the left SVC was draining into the right atrium or if it was draining into the left atrium. So follow the left SVC and you will see that it drains normally into the coronary sinus 
ear and into the right atrium. Now, and as I was scrolling down, you may have noticed that it's pretty peculiar that all of the contrast is in the left atrium here. And that's because look at his right atrium, which happens to not go to his right atrium, or his right SVC does not go to his right atrium, but goes straight into his right, into his left atrium, which I have never seen this combination before. I didn't even realize that you could just get isolated drainage of the right SVC into the left atrium. It turns out there's probably a little anomalous vein here too. There's not even a sinus spinosis ASD. There's just absolutely no connection between his right SVC and his right atrium. And so, of course, when you question, they injected his right upper extremity for his bubble study, which explains why he had a TIA and a stroke because the bubbles went straight to his brain in a large quantity. Now, here's the, here's the MR, and I'll admit that it was, I think, satisfaction of search, and we didn't have great anatomic imaging, but you can see the same thing, and I was just focused on the left SVC, and you can see on the stack of cines that, sure enough, you know, it goes into the coronary sinus, and then the right SVC, you know, right here, you lose it, and I just admit that I didn't see it there. But fortunately, this was done after the, the, the um, echo as well, so my overlooking of this abnormality didn't lead to the stroke. But I, I have never seen this before. I don't know if anybody else has heard of this, Brandon, if art is there. I did find one case of this almost identical story from a couple of years ago. Patient with a persistent left SVC, they did a bubble study, had a TIA. So pretty interesting. Wow. So wow. Travis, wow. wouldn't you consider this yeah. probably on the spectrum of a sinus venosis type ASD, but the, the septal defect isn't there, but it's sort of the same thing and you have that anomaly. Sure. Yeah. Looks like there's that not right there's that anomalous vein coming in, right? You're so right. If there is an anomalous vein, you can see on the on the on the delay. But yeah, there's no. I mean, there isn't the sinus venosus ASD though that you would see. Right. So I I've tried I've tried to name this crisscross superior vena cava. I think it's, but uh, just bizarre. So, so anyway, I think the moral of the story is if you see um, you know. Look at both. Look at the right SVC too. That occasionally it will drain into an abnormal location, as well. And actually, here's another little tiny the anomalous vein that drains in separately there. So hmm. I know that was a that was an odd one. All right, here's the guy that finally came back. He's one that was seen in an outside hospital this summer, and his story is that he's a drug user alcoholic, eventually came in with chest pain or something, they did a radiograph and saw this, this abnormal, or these abnormalities. And you can see he's got a bunch of bilateral, some look a little bit more well-defined than others, nodular areas of consolidation. And he's got this more confluent stuff in the right hilum. And he was relatively asymptomatic. Got a CT at the outside hospital and you see that he has, and these are very thick slices, but you see a lot of discrete nodules, and then you see more lymphadenopathy and just confluent areas of consolidation around both hyla, a lot of surrounding of the bronchi here. So he underwent biopsy times two at the outside hospital, has no history of cancer. He had a CT guided biopsy of one of these. He had a transbronchial biopsy. Both came back negative. So, of course, he was presented at our tumor board, and you know we thought maybe sarcoid or something you know, granulomatous infection, like even a little bit of fibrosing medius tinnitus here. There's not a lot of calcification here, but of course he had no history of cancer and wasn't doing all that bad. He finally came back to us and we did a core biopsy. And now you can see that there's a little bit of high density in some of these, looks like calcification. And a couple of the lung nodules, I think, yeah, here you can see a little, maybe a little bit of calcium in here. Mm. Anyway, our, our core biopsy, and I don't have his report. Let me let me pull up his report because I know I have it here. Uh, I'll show you what the core biopsy showed. But uh, it showed hyalinizing granulomas. And so this is presumably pulmonary hyalinizing granulomas, which I'd seen one case of when I was a resident. I looked through our teaching files because I was trying to find some other ones but couldn't find any. Um, I don't know, and you guys can help contribute to your understanding of the path. What I remember my take home from this was that it's essentially similar to fibrosing medius tinnitus, except it occurs in the lung parenchyma. And Jeff, I don't know, 
or, or David or Howard or Brent, if you guys can add more to that. But I did find a couple of papers because one, one of the ones I found said that it's, it has an association with retroperitoneal fibrosis, which instantly made me think of IgG4. And sure enough, there have been a couple of recent articles describing an overlap of hyaluronizing granuloma and IgG4. So my question for the team is now going to be, is this really IgG4? And I don't know the answer to that yet, but I bet it probably is since pulmonary hyaluronizing granuloma was, de was described long before IgG4 was a recognized entity. So. Yeah, who knows? You know, if you look at the old literature, they always say that pulmonary hyaluronizing granuloma and then nodules can be really quite large with calcifications as you show. Yeah some kind of ill understood hyperimmune response to a granulomatous infection. So it's not surprising perhaps that with the passage of time, people begin to find IgG for plasma cells in whatever this entity actually is. Yeah. That's really interesting. It's, it's, yeah, I guess the other thing, like Coxie was something we were th thinking about, but this, the, no Coxie grew out of him. Yeah, Jeff. Travis, it looks so strikingly sarcoid-like. I mean, even with the large opacities, the volume loss in the upper lobes, the bronchovascular bundles. I know. You wonder if it's sort of a, as, as, as it was said, sort of a, on that spectrum of an immune response. Yeah. Instead of epithelial granulomas, you get these hyalinizing ones. I, I thought you were going to tell us this was talcosis from his IV drug use. Uh, no, I wish. <laughs> you know, it, does, it, does, it has an upper lung concentration a la sarcoid rather than a basal, con consolidate, a basal concentration a la something intravascularly disseminated. Yeah. 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 So I, I don't know. I, I still think I don't really understand hyalinizing granuloma, and it may be because it's just a, a very poorly understood disease in I general. No one understands it, but sometimes I've seen pictures of the nodules of it being very large and dramatic. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I still think sarcoid, yeah. I agree, could be on the table here or IgG4 something. But all right, I've, I've got more, but I'll stop there just since Jeff and Brent still have cases to show. All right, Brent. Brent, are you there? There we go. Yes, there we go. I just unmuted myself. No problem. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so this is apropos of a couple of cases that people have shown over the last couple of weeks. And you can see on the uh, screen here, uh, we have a uh, sinus of Valsalva aneurysm um, rising from the right sinus. And the interesting thing here, um, as um, you know, Art Stillman had been pointing out to me, is that there's this. Uh, not only is there an association with um, supercrystal um, VSDs, but it's thought that there's a mechanism that can underlie the association, and that's the windsock mechanism, where the um, supercrystal uh, VSD, uh, you know, as a defect, leads to um, a jet phenomenon that can gradually uh, impinge on the sinus and then lead to enlargement of it. And if you look here, you can see that there, yeah, I grant that there's some aortic valvular calcification, but if you look down here, um, uh, there's a calcification that um, doesn't look like it's arising from the valve itself, but it's um, where you might expect a super crystal uh, VSD to be. And um, if we can go to, let me go to my uh, reformats here. Let me see if I can show you. Here we go. The MPRs here that I've made um, through this this region here, you can see that uh, not only is there a, a calcification there, but there's also um, this is in, in the region of presumably where there was a um, a supercrystal um, you know VSD, and you can actually see that in this region there may be a, a residual small uh, supercrystal VSD in the same region that you might expect the jet to. Kind of be able to enlarge the right sinus. So this is kind of in keeping with um, proof uh, or very suggest suggestive of the windsock phenomenon where supercrystal VSD can lead to over time a sinus of Valsalva aneurysm. So I just thought that was an interesting phenomenon that uh, that Art uh, pointed out to me. So um, I don't know so if other people kind of noticed this. Space bar to make those crosshairs go away. I think if you hit the space oh, yes. bar, it won't yes. go away. Well, let me uh, let me do that. Cool. 
on our three. Just hit on the top right there. Yep. To make, and then show us on that one image where you think the communication is. Yep. Right here. Ah, got it. So I had trouble. I thought I might have seen your cursor there, but now I see it. So that's the potential communication. So, so maybe, you know, it's a tiny residual one, but the, the point would be that sometimes these uh, are, you know, congenital and then they can seal. Um, but after, even after they seal, you know, the, they've um, created, had time to create this uh, through a windsock phenomenon. So it's just, you know, one theory about why these can be associated. So. Hey, Brent, what's the, what were the median sternotomy wires for? What did, did he have a cabbage or what? Uh, that's a good question. I can't remember. Let's see. Uh, cabbage. Yeah, we have a lemma there. So, and another vein graft here. So, yeah, yeah. But anyway, I just thought that was an interesting uh, case. Um, here's a really interesting case, uh, also courtesy of Art. And let me bring this one up. And um, Actually, let me see. I have to flip to the screen here. Okay, here we go. So this was a Grady patient, is a Grady patient. And um, coming down uh, this CT, I think, believe this is a patient in um, you know 30s or early 40s. You can see coming down um, that there's extensive, look at the, uh, the, the soft tissues, the chest wool here and the, um, the skin extensive thickening here of skin and um, it's sort of nodular, uh, very extensive involving the uh, truncal regions here. Um, we see it involving, um, you know, breast, uh, anterior to the breast tissue here, going all the way up. You see some involving the axillary regions here as well. Um, also, you can see the internal mammary lymph nodes, very enlarged, at least on the right. And coming down, um, you see pleural fusions here as well. So, um, you know, what would you, you know, think of in this case? I mean, I can tell you what we thought of. Um, we thought of uh, cutaneous T cell lymphoma um, as one possible explanation for the lymph node enlargement and also this extensive skin thickening. Um, any other ideas about before I tell you the real diagnosis? Lymphedema from something. Inflammatory breast cancer or yep. something? Yep, that would be another thing. I mean, that would be very extensive. And I, I don't know if I've ever seen one that went down quite so so far as inflammatory. Yeah, but yeah I mean, other good ideas. Um, this is actually a case of, let me flip to, this is actually not an image of this patient, but um, this is a, of a, a similar patient with a similar stage of hydradenitis superativa. Um, so this was extensive um, involvement, and this is a case of grade three or stage three hydronitis superativa, and in which you have multiple sinus tracts and little confluent pustules that develop uh, within the skin that go very, very deep and form a plaque-like uh, confluence. And this is what this patient had had for, for a number of years, and um, she would just get eruptions and super infections, and it had become very, very confluent. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find a, an image, um, you know, in the, in the chart of, of this particular patient, but this is what you can imagine it might have looked like. But just the most extensive um, hydronitis case that, that I've, I've seen that kind of mimics a, a more diffuse abnormality like a T-cell lymphoma or something in the skin. So have you all ever seen such an extensive case? No, no, no. Jeez. Normally, the, you know, normally the cases that I've seen have been like, you know, we can see at the corner of the image here have been concentrating in the axillary regions, which this disease is known to do, but um, this is so extensive, but it had been, you know, just continuously treated by dermatology and, you know, just very bad case of it. So, and let me show another case that just came across, I guess, today that I thought was a very interesting case. Um, this is a case of a young, uh, young patient um, who's been through some spinal surgery. You can see some scoliosis here. Um, let me first show you the mediastinum, um, also sort of reminiscent of one of the cases today, but you can see that um, there's an abnormal tubular soft tissue mass in the anterior mediastinum. You can see it's not a venous structure, it's not an arterial structure, just sort of hanging out in the mediastinum. 
Um, starting going down here, you see paraspinal uh, soft tissue uh, masses. You can see down here, you see intercostal soft tissue masses. Um, let's go down to the abdomen because there's an interesting vascular finding. You can see the thoracic aorta, um, not too bad, but look down here, there's been a, um, there's really, really severe hypoplasia of, of the abdominal aorta. In fact, there, it was so bad that, um, you know, a graft had to be placed, a jump graft to bypass that, that segment. But look how tiny that is, giving rise to, um, you know, celiac artery has, is, is sort of, you know, occluded proximally reconstitutes via collaterals. And then, you know, we go to more normal caliber in the uh, distal um, abdominal aorta. And this patient is um, a neurofibroma, uh, neurofibromatosis patient with just an ins interesting constellation of findings. So this is a mediastinal uh, neurofibroma, you know, rising along the course of presumably, um, you know, phrenic or vagus nerve here um, going through the mediastinum. And uh, we often see just really small ones. I think I've shown some other ones on this conference, but this one is one of the larger ones that I've seen. Um, you know, it could even be mistaken for like an enlarged uh, superior intercostal vein or something, but it, it's not. It's a big neurofibroma here. And of course, these other things were neurofibromas throughout the uh, intercostal regions and uh, paraspinal regions. So, and the lectomy like, diaphragm is doing okay. Let's see, you know, do we have some cruise atrophy down there or? Uh, let's see. Let's see. Um, what do you think? I mean, it doesn't look elevated. Uh, it's got good, it uh, has reasonable thickness down there. Yeah. So you think, you think that was a phrenic neurofibroma then, the, the mediastinal lesion on the left? Well, or other nerve here. I mean, it's, you know, it looks like it's, it's, very similar to a lot of other uh, mediastinal, you know, neurofibromas that we've seen. So, except it's much larger. So, but it's it's interesting. I mean, and, and then we had a lot of mediastinal uh, abdominal soft tissue here encasing the uh, the vessels that presumably plexiform neurofibromas throughout the the abdomen here as well. So, I thought it was an interesting complex of different findings in neurofibromatosis. Don't have many skin findings here though. So. That's the thing that's missing, but I thought that was an interesting case. Do those patients get a primary vasculopathy? I'm trying to remember if they do, or if you think it's all just come. I, I mean, as far as I understand it, it's a sort of congenital hypoplasia that they, um, you know, or, or I think, I think yeah. sort of congenital hypoplasia is what we're, um, you know, thinking. So that's what I always so, understand. Right, so there's the entity of middle aortic syndrome where you get narrowing there. And it, I always remember the differentials like Williams syndrome, Takayasu arteritis, or neurofibromatosis. And I don't know why, but that's, that, those are like the big three things that cause that. You know, I think Tan showed a case uh, a few years ago. Tan Mohammed had a case of this uh, diminutive abdominal aorta in the setting of neurofibromatosis. So. Uh -huh. Ringing a bell, yeah. He posted a case about, I think, four years ago. Oh, yeah, Middle, yeah. Metal neurotic syndrome or something, as Travis said, yeah. Rings a bell. Wow. So, yeah, we have another, I'll, I'll bring up, we have a case of middle, uh, mid aortic syndrome uh, as well, but I'll bring that up some other day. <laughs> I think, let me, let me just do one more um, uh, case. Uh, Let's see. Actually, well, let me in there because uh, I think Jeff has a couple of cases too. Sorry about taking so long. There. That's all right. All right, I've got to show a couple here. It'll be quick. Uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, this was a fresh case uh, that I ran into the other evening. Let's see. You should see. I'm going to show a little out of order because we didn't have the radiographs at the time. But here's patient's radiograph from some time ago, and you can see he's got a little extra bump here. He's a known vasculopath, has a domal aortic aneurysm that's been fixed, an iliac aneurysm that's hanging out, and this sort of dilated, somewhat tortuous descending aorta. Presents um, a year later looking like this, and you can see there's marked abnormality of the azogosophageal recess, there's pleural fluid, and this bump is bigger. I'll put them up side by side. You can see there's been, well, you can't see both, but there's been a change. Um, so we got a CT scan in our emergency department. This is the non-con because there was concern for acute aortic pathology. You can see there's that saccular aneurysm. And 
So you go further down, you'll see the aorta gets quite big. And what's important is the high attenuation in the wall, this heterogeneity of it here. And then even more important is this is a beautiful example of a fat stripe sign. So you've got this pleural collection, you've got extra pleural fat, and then you've got this extra pleural hematoma. So clearly this blood is coming from somewhere, and I think it's leaking along the left cruise. So this is a leaking aortic aneurysm. We have contrasted images that, conf that show the, the aneurysm. Didn't see any active extravasation at the time, and so they did eventually take him to the OR um, because he was having worsening pain. And it was an act, it was, there was a clot around it. it was, they called it a contained rupture, but they did comment on the extra pleural um, blood as well. So it was probably an oozing aorta. Um, just Jeff, it's, it's, it's also a really nice example of the uh, draped, uh, draped aortic sign there. It's, it's draping over the vertebral body. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah, so a good one. And then we had a, I don't have it, but we had an abdominal one that rolled in last night. Same thing, blood in the abdomen and uh, that high attenuation wall. So uh, you know, whether you call it impending rupture, I call I change this to leaking, and I liked that over um, over impending rupture because I think it was actually leaking. Um, and one more I wanted to show real quickly. This is kind of cool, and I may have shown this years ago, but I don't remember. But Daniela showed it to me this morning because she was asking me about it. So this is a patient with sickle cell disease and has this funny looking space in the left lower lobe that sort of looks like it has some pleura around it. I thought it was probably a variant of bronchial atresia. And then there was this funny area that had been on several scans of consolidated lung. And if you go further down into the abdomen, there's a little nubbin right here coming off the aorta. So this patient has had years of over a decade of imaging. So we found an old CT uh, with some contrast on board that if we go further down, we will see that indeed this is a sequestration here and there's the feeding artery. It kind of goes out, loops down and comes back up. So I think this is a hybrid lesion of a sequestration with a probable bronchial atresia somewhere, some variant in there because that hyperinflated lung. But interestingly, it's spontaneously thrombosed at some point, probably from her sickle cell. I've never seen one sort of auto, auto you know, Ectomize itself. I don't know. We don't see a lot of sickle cell here. I don't know, um, Travis. In your experience at uh, Grady, if you ever saw spontaneous thrombosis of something like this, usually I think of microvascular disease. Mm -hmm. right. All right. Wow. No. If I, Jeff, I have Con's case. I can show briefly if you uh, if you yep. want. Sounds good. that Tom posted several years ago of a person with neurofibromatosis and a pretty normal looking descending thoracic aorta. And then we get down into the abdomen and suddenly things become diminutive, looking a lot like the case we just saw from Brent. So this again is the uh, neurofibromatosis causing abdominal aortic narrowing. And this is from Tom in, in uh, 2010. Excellent. All right, well, thanks everybody. They call it abdominal coarctation in neurofibromatosis type one. And it's it's a, yeah, I'll show it right here. And I'll send out this, this paper, but it's some intimal proliferation, special type of fibromuscular dysplasia unique to NF1. So it's, um, and it can be associated with, with renal artery stenosis and, uh, and cause renal vascular hypertension. So it sounds like that's what, that this is some sort of fibromuscular dysplasia and just proliferation unique to NF1. All right. All right. That's interesting.